thing if these um, income is subject to tax, where where the tax where where rather the sportsman is a resident of one country and he is in another country at the point in time, we look at the provisions of the double taxation agreement between the two countries. Okay, because the idea behind the double taxation agreement is essentially one income should not be taxed twice. So, where for example. Um, a Malaysian sports player wins um, a competition in China. I'm not too sure what the Chinese tax laws are, but let's just say, for example, <coughs> China tax laws taxes the income received by a non-resident which he gains, which he derives from China. Then the double taxation agreement will essentially say that in that instance, that same income will not be charged in Malaysia. Okay, so you get what is known as a credit, where you pay taxes abroad and you bring it back. Okay. Okay, these are just some of the cases that I just very briefly wanted to share with you what we came across with, uh, came across on in the course of research. First case, Commissioner of Taxation in Stone. This is a relatively new decision uh, which was decided by the highest court in Australia, the High Court. And essentially, uh, what the court had ruled here is prize money and sponsorship, which is received by a sportsman are part of an athlete's taxable income. Just very briefly, I'll take you through the facts of the case. Um, the taxpayer here, who is known as Joanna Stone, she was, um, she's an elite athlete in the business of throwing javelins for financial reward. Okay. Besides, outside her sports world, she was also a police officer. Okay. Question that arose was when she went out and represented Australia in all these international competitions, the income, or rather the prize monies that she receives, the government grants that she receives, the appearance fees that she receives, are, what can these considered to be her business income, which is subjected to tax in Australia? Okay, her argument was, look, no, I am not in the business of doing sports. I merely represent my country out of, my, out of passion, okay? I am not in the business of conducting a business in sports. So the income or whatever monies that I earn in relation to my sporting activities should not be subjected to tax. Of course, the Australian Tax Office did not agree and decided to litigate this matter all the way up to the highest court in the country. So essentially, what the um, what the sorry what the Australian Tax Office argued that was because was because Miss Stone Joanna Stone had turned her athletic talent to account for money. The returns were business income, the monies that she received were business income, and her contention that she had never sought to profit financially for her sport was considered to be irrelevant. Okay. And Joanna Stone argued that she was not conducting a business. Her motivation was merely to desire to excel as a sportswoman and to represent Australia in all of these competitions. When the matter went up all the way to the High Court, High Court essentially ruled that the income from sports was accessible for tax. So whatever gains that she received, all her appearance fees, her grants, her sponsorship and whatnot, court had ruled that um, this is business in nature, she was you know, in the course of doing it um, for business, so this is seen to be taxable income on her part. Okay, so the few hundred thousand dollars that she won, that she got, um, those, was, those were essentially taxable at the end of the day. Okay, with Agassi and Robinson, so Andre Agassi also had to go to court, and the question was, um, the issue was in regards to the endorsement income that he received, uh, which was paid in connection with an appearance at a UK tennis tournament. Okay? Was that income taxable? In Agassi, matter went up all the way to the House of Lords, and this was a, a situation whereby Agassi received payments under two sponsorship contracts between a company owned um, and controlled by Andre Agassi, Nike and Headspot. And it was held that these payments were accessible under UK tax law. Okay? This is despite the fact, mind you, that none of the parties to the contract were resident or domiciled in UK. Okay? No one was no one belonged to the UK in that sense. 
and none of the player companies conducted business directly or indirectly through branches or agencies in the UK. Okay, so basically there was no physical presence in the UK. Essentially, it was an instance whereby the whole point, the whole reason why this arose is because the money which Agassi received derived from the UK. So UK sought to tax that income. Okay? Uh, I mean, there were, there are, of course, you know, there are lots of articles that I came across which, um, which basically crit criticized the decision because, you know, why are you taxing income whereby none of the parties are resident in the UK? It was just an instance whereby just so happened the winnings were obtained in a competition which arose, which happened in the UK. Okay. <coughs> but in any event, it was found by the House of Lords the endorsement income which was paid in connection with appearance at the UK tournament was taxable. Okay. Next case I want to take you through. Um, okay, that that finding is a bit a bit a bit um, inaccurate. Essentially, in Sports Club and Inspector of Taxes, image rights. Remember, image rights—a topic that uh, Fung spoke about earlier. Image rights in this particular case was found to not be a taxable income because it was found not to be done in the course of business. Essentially, it was a side thing that happened. The court in this, in this case essentially held that that image, the income which the sportsmen derived from image rights was not taxable. But this was a decision which was at the special commissioners, which is the lower court when it comes to tax. I didn't find decisions on further, I'm not too sure if it went on further appeal because I didn't find decisions that um, was reported in regard to this. Davis and Harrison is essentially an issue whether accrued benefit received upon transfer of player is taxable or not. Davis and Harrison, interestingly, um, involved Everton Football Club. I'm not sure if Everton representatives are still here, but <laughs> this is a very old English case that we came across in the course of research. Essentially here, Harrison was employed as a professional player by Everton Football Club. Okay, and the rules of the football league, which were binding on Everton Club, essentially said, well, essentially permitted the club to enter into an agreement with the player for the payment to him by the club of a money benefit. So you can pay a money benefit to your player after five playing after playing five seasons continuously. So five years of continuous service, you are entitled to play to pay your player a money benefit, and it continued to say a second benefit after 10 season service, you can also pay money benefit to your player. And further, in the event of the player's transfer to another club, before the expiry of the period, to pay him as a reward for loyal and meritorious service in lieu of presumed accrued share of benefit, a percentage of the promised benefit. So essentially, there's a rule which is issued by the Football League which binds a Everton Football Club which outline these um, particular items. So where players have been essentially loyal to the football club, they've hit five years of service, subsequently 10 years of service, and any time in between that, if they are transferred to another club, for the years of service they have been with the club, um, the football club can essentially reward the player with a money benefit. Okay. So what happened was, sometime in May 1922, very old case, okay, 1922, the club agreed to pay the respondent a benefit amounting to £650. Not very much in today's um, monetary value, but perhaps in 1922 was a lot of money. Uh, so essentially, he should receive a benefit of £650 if he is still engaged by the club in the season following his completion of 10 consecutive seasons with the club. In April 1923, he was engaged for the season ending May 1924, but in November 1923, he was released and transferred to another club. Okay? And sometime in a month after that, it was decided by Everton Club that, look, this player has been with us long enough, and for the number of years that he's been with us, we want to reward him an accrued benefit. And permission was sought from the Football League, permission was given, money subsequently paid to the player. Question that arises whether the money which is paid to the player, is that taxable? Because mind you, you know, this is not uh, something which is an ongoing thing which is paid, it was just basically at the end of his term 
we had edited for book club, he was paid the sum of money. Matter went to court, and you know, it was argued by both sides, so HMRC and the respondent, and it was decided by the court that payment to the respondent was found to be remuneration for services rendered in his employment and as such was found to be accessible to tax in the UK. Okay? So, those were the few cases that I wanted to share with you earlier, uh, just today. So you can see I put the Everton badge. Um, <laughs> is, is the Everton um, is it representative still here? Because Oh, what a shame! Earlier, uh, just today. So you can see I put the Everton badge. Um, <laughs> <laughs> is the Everton um, is it representative still here? Because oh, what a shame! <laughs> oh, okay, okay. <laughs> All right. So yeah, question then arises when it comes to sports and tax. Are the winnings subject to tax? The royalties that you receive is that subject to tax? The merchandise sales subject to tax? Or the endorsements that athletes do would that be subject to tax? So these are the sort of issues that have arisen from time to time you know, when it comes to taxation and sports. I did not come across tax cases involving Malaysian athletes and tax law for now. It could be an instance whereby it was just unreported, or it could just be an instance whereby um, the sports association is not, you know, uh, not too keen to argue this case before court. Uh, but in any event, um, it is. It is, it, is, it is something for, for you to think about as sportsmen or sports association, sports club. But you just bear in mind that there are tax issues when it comes to the, the activities that you do. Okay? And in an instance whereby you feel you are aggrieved by an assessment, which is issued by the revenue, of course, I just wanted, to take you, or I just wanted you to know that there is an appeal process, and this is basically the chart which outlines the approval process. So essentially, let's start with the first box. Within 30 days from the date you, you receive a notice of additional assessment, you have to file in, if you want to appeal, you have to file in the notice of appeal, which is otherwise known as Form Q. Okay? By filing in a, no a notice of appeal, it protects your right, of course. Um, and after that, what happens to the Form Q is, this Form Q will go to the IRB, the Inner Revenue Board, and they have 12 months to review their notice of appeal to decide whether or not they want to continue if they don't agree with you, or if they agree with you, then the matter can be resolved out of court. Once the matter is decided by the IRB, whether or not they want to proceed or they want to settle, if, say, in the instance whereby they decide to proceed with litigation, the form is then forwarded to the Special Commissioners of Income Tax, which will be the panel hearing your matter. Okay? And full trial will take place. This essentially means that um, evidence will be put forward, witnesses will be called, um, submissions will be made, written submissions will be put into court. And in an instance, if either one of the parties is aggrieved by the decision of the special commissioners, next level of appeal is high court. Okay? And again, if any party is aggrieved by the decision of high court, the final court that you go to is the court of appeal. All right? So in an instance, if you, meet, if you miss the 30-day deadline to file in your Form Q, you can put in an application by way of Form N, which is a notice for application for extension of time to file in your Form Q. But of course, if you file in Form N, it is not as a right. Unlike Form Q, it's your right to put in an appeal um, as a taxpayer. When it comes to Form N, you essentially need to justify your reason for delay. Why is it that it's taking, it's taking you more than 30 days to file your notice of appeal? And that decision is to be made by the Inland Revenue Board. Okay? So just some things for you to bear in mind if you are affected by a tax assessment. Okay? Well, thank you very much. That concludes my presentation.